Hi, I'm Stephen Dowd, founder of Enduro Challenge, the world's biggest live streamed, fully inclusive indoor rowing charity event. I'm also the host of the Head to Head podcast series, and I'm absolutely honoured today to be introducing you to Kat Ross. Hi, Kat. Welcome to the show. Hi, Steve. Thanks for having me. Oh, my absolute pleasure. Uh, I mean, it really is my pleasure. I get to interview people all around the world that have rowing related stories. And uh, this time we're coming all the way over to you in sunny Canberra in Australia. What, what is it like over there at the moment? Obviously Christmas for you. Well, Christmas for us is usually quite warm. Um, unfortunately, the weather's been pretty terrible lately, pretty cold and, and not as sunny as we would like, but it looks like it might be heating up over the next few days. So we're looking forward to that. No, we are as well. Obviously, it's very weird for everyone and all those people watching Christmas is definitely a little strange again for, for a second year. So uh, one of those challenges that's been thrown at us that we're all having to go through. Um, but, but we'll get there. We'll get there together. right? With our resilience muscles flexing hard, we'll, we'll get through. Um, but the reason you're on today and the reason that I was absolutely honoured for you to agree to, to come on to the, the podcast today was to discuss some of the elements of challenge, change and resilience that you've had to face, not just through your rowing journey, uh, obviously before that as well and part of the reason that you got into rowing. Uh, so I'd love to dive into some of those questions. Uh, but before I do, not everyone will know who Cat Ross is. So I'm going to give a tiny intro but i'm probably going to miss lots of this so do feel free to chip in and, and tell me where we're going wrong here but um cat so you're four times world champion power rower is that right correct yes fantastic and you've competed if i'm not wrong at four olympics now the tokyo was your fourth olympics yes uh, yes i started uh, back in 08 when rowing was first introduced uh in the games and um i'm one of very few uh people across the world i think there's only five of us across the world who have been to every single one so i don't know i think we must be uh pretty crazy to keep going the way we go with rowing absolutely but what an incredible uh accomplishment to be in all four of the power Olympics. absolutely incredible um and in 2008 which was the beijing games uh you medaled so tell us about your your accomplishments there yeah that was pretty surreal actually um i'd only started rowing probably 18 18 months before that um so it was very quick turnarounds and you know I had the goal focus of this is what I wanted to do and I wanted to win a gold medal and it was all a bit you know that was that was the goal of focus and um it was some epic racing uh, against some of the best across the world and uh missed out on gold by 0.8 of a second so it was literally just Whoever got their oar in the water the first, you know, first, the quickest, um, crossed that line. But it was some epic racing. That is incredible. 0.8 of a second. I remember a similar conversation with a guy who I'm sure you'll know called Akira Abdullah, um, who was the first guest of the first head to head show last season. And then he missed out on Olympic qualification by a fraction of a second. It's absolutely crazy. Must those, those moments must be quite telling of you. They must draw something out of you. Uh, what did you find at that time? How did you respond? Uh, look, you know, I was pretty ecstatic with the result, even though, you know, gold is what you want. And um, it, it's very hard when it's that small. You can't beat yourself up about it. I mean, and you do look for different ways of what could have been done better. Where could have you got that extra little bit? But it comes down to racing. Racing's racing. You race against the conditions. You race against the different uh, countries and the different athletes. And it's just whoever's better and everything aligns on that day. And unfortunately, just that one extra little stroke wasn't quite in. If we had, you know, it, 10 more metres would have been well ahead. So unfortunately, it was just how the cards fell for that day. I worked hard, as hard as I could towards that gold. Um, but, you know, you can't control what other people do. You control what I can do. And unfortunately, it wasn't quite enough. But, um, you know, it was still real ecstatic about that. I mean, I just fell into the sport through a talent identification. So, you know, I can't. It was a different path of my life and it was pretty exciting and epic. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, still took away a silver medal at the Paralympic Games, right? So, yeah, who's losing there, really? Uh, I think from uh, from your side as well, as a, you're a PR2 rower, is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, I'm in a class. Um, it, it used to be called Trunk and Arms, and then it's got changed to PR2, whereas I basically row upper body. I don't use try use my lower legs. Um, I don't have a sliding seat like the normal conventional rowing boat. Um, so sometimes we used to strap our legs down. Now we don't so much. Um, but, yeah, it's all completely upper body. So it's, it's 
pretty hard work. So arms, shoulders, abs, uh, and and lots of sheer grunt force. <laughs> oh, yeah, and lower back. I think a lower back are pretty much our legs. So if anyone ever, you know, talks about back pain, I kind of feel in them. Um, but, um, yeah, we have quite, in our class, our uh, torso is very, very strong. Sure, sure. And as we mentioned, between 2008, you're not long into the games, through to the recent games, you've picked up a few kind of acknowledgements uh, and achievements along the line as well. I've, I've got just from my notes, the, the 2011 Sports Achievement Award from the Australian Institute of Sport, uh, the World Rowing Para Crew of the Year with Gavin Bellis, who was your partner at the time uh, in 2013. And then in 2014, Rowing Australia's Female Athlete of the Year. And again in 2019, um, from Rowing Australia and from CBR, the Para Athlete of the Year as well. So you're definitely picking up the certificates for the wall that your mum will be uh, fiercely proud of, I'm sure. Oh, extremely. I mean, they're always the icing on the cake. Um, you know, you have your goals and your focus. And, you know, I, I want to achieve that first gold medal for, for Australia if I, if I can ever get there. Um, but they're all icing on the cake and they're just wonderful achievements of the journey that you have and the people that you meet along the way and hopefully the influences that you have to other people as well to show out in those results. Yeah, completely. And uh, I think that's one of the real motifs of the Paralympic movement, isn't it? That you're not just performing and competing, you're you're representing and people are watching you and their lives are changing as a result. Uh, so talk to me a little bit about the early days, because obviously you've come into rowing as a PR2 athlete, but you've not you've not been a PR2 athlete. Um, for very long, but you have um, had a changed uh, lower limb experience from just being a tiny baby, if, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, from my accident, um, I was two and a half years of age uh, when I was run over by a lawnmower, ride on lawnmower. Um, um, unfortunately, my father didn't know I was outside running around and I heard the lawnmower and did what every other kid usually does and goes around to get a ride. Um, Dad used to give us rides on the lawnmower. Please, no one do that. <laughs> um, you know, and I, I heard mum put me outside to play thinking all the gates were shut because dad was at the front of the house. And unfortunately, um, you know, I somehow I got around there where the gate wasn't shut or I climbed over, not sure. Um, and unfortunately, my dad didn't know I was there and backed over me. Um, and it's just one of those freak accidents that, you know, you, you don't really hear about. At the time, it was, you know, 83. Um Definitely not really heard of back then so much. And my poor parents, quite young, they're in their 20s, um, then had had a lifelong journey with me uh, with this injury. And, um, yeah, but it's shaped who I am today. Oh, fantastic. Um, so you – if and, again, correct me if I'm wrong, without going into all the gory details of the thing, you, you effectively end up with a fused ankle and knee on the right side, I believe. Well, not initially because um, the damage was so extensive um, and, and surgeons at the time didn't really know what to do. The, dam the lawnmower had actually damaged and sliced the inside of my knee, cutting growth plates um, and all the way down. It actually went in between my toes. So I actually didn't lose any toes, but it cut right in between my toes. So cut the knee, cut, you can imagine the blades going, cut the knee, cut the ankle down, right down to the foot. And, you know, being a two-year-old, my leg wasn't, you know, that long. Um, but did some extensive damage. At the time, surgeons um, had convinced my parents that I was better off keeping it. Um, you're better off having your own than having a prosthetic. I mean, prosthetics aren't the fantastic uh, instruments that they have nowadays. Um, back then they were pretty primitive and um, they weren't really a great option. So over the next, gosh, right up until I was about uh, only even recent, uh, I've had a lot of corrective surgery and corrective surgery to just be able to walk. And that's uh, because as the, when the growth plates are cut, my knee then grew a, a, a different angle on the um, inside to the outside because you have growth plates on either side of your knee. Um, so I had a lot of corrective surgery to correct the alignment, correct the um, – because it never used to straighten, so I had to get tendons cut all the time to straighten. Um, it didn't grow as fast as my other leg. And um, so what resulted in was I had – continuous surgery and a lot of it was some of it was quite experimental because they were unsure what to do so as time was developing um, and technology was developing ideas were developing um, surgeons 
were willing to try different options and a lot of it was very experimental and they were trial and error. Um, some not so good and I wouldn't wish them upon anybody. Others were absolutely brilliant and um, have, have led to me to be able to walk as best as I can um, today. Um, I recently just had the leg uh, lengthened and my ankle fused because I had a horrific amount of pain in the ankle and it was really restricting my training ability, which, you know, is quite important to me. Um, <laughs> and so I had that fuse. So I don't have any pain there at the moment, but then the leg was a bit shorter again, so I had to have it lengthened. So um, I still walk with a limp, but uh, it's I'm not in the pain, not in any pain, and it's viable at the moment. So um, it has been a huge journey over since since I was two and a half. So and it's it's going to be a continuous journey, unfortunately. No, of course, uh, and I'm I'm sorry to hear that. Although, like you say, you wouldn't be where you are without that story. Uh, so it it is part of our story. I guess that's the thing with disability, isn't it? Is that you you either reject it or you you bring it into the camp and kind of use it almost. Definitely. And I, I hear that a lot from people, particularly Paralympians. Yeah, uh, so you faced a whole bunch of challenges. Clearly, I mean, not just the physical, but the emotional and mental that, that comes along with that. Right? Tell us about the the younger you growing up with carrying disability but also being different to to others maybe at school and, and how did that affect you how did you cope with those things um I think I've always been quite a little bit headstrong in um terms of you know don't tell me what I can't do kind of thing but as I grew up yeah it was very difficult um school was a time of you know bullying and um you know you were different and people don't like different um but I used that to, you know, for my advantage to show and prove that I can do anything that anybody else does. Um, I used to have to fight with the teachers in um, primary school especially to let me go in running race, even though I would come last, even though, you know, but I wanted that challenge to race against everybody else and show that I can do it. Um, and even my, my parents had to fight with other people around them to give me the chance, give me an opportunity. Um I think a lot of people were afraid of my disability because they didn't know how to handle it. I mm. think I went on the same school camp to the dinosaur park like for four years in a row while everybody else got to go and do, um, you know, go and ski trips and all kinds of things. So little things, um, you know, I had to fight for. And, and I think at an early age um, that helped drive how I am today. And, you know, credit to my parents um, I'm one of six kids, so they didn't have time to baby me. Um, <laughs> you know, we ran a farm um, out in, out in um, rural Victoria and I was never treated anything different from my siblings. So, yeah. you know, I had to fight for everything I had um, and I think that helped me become who I am and have that real hard drive and determination Um you know, as life went on, high school was also, you know, I had to really stand up for myself um, pretty heavily. And, and people learnt, I think, very quickly that there was more to me than just my disability. Uh, you know, I had a crack at everything. I had a crack at all different sports. I had a crack at, you know, lots of academics, um, events. Um, and, you know, I played netball. I had a go at basketball. I had a go at um, badminton and... Um, you know, as life went on in my early 20s, I did speedway racing. Um, and then, yeah, so like I've dabbled in lots of different things over the years. Um, and, and, you know, even, oh God, I used to even play in a uh, pipe band with a uh, Scottish pipe band and, and did oh, that. Wow. To a, yeah, I loved it and did that to a national level and set myself the goals. And, um, you know, at that time in the solo drumming side, that's what I did. You know, I, um, you know, at that time I came number one in Australia. So then I was like, right, what's the next challenge? So I always pushed myself beyond. Um, and I'd like to show people around that who were trying to pull me down, but not, I don't think they were initially trying to pull me down um, as what we would call, you know, suppressing someone. It was wrapping me up in cotton wool because they were a lot afraid mm. uh that I, that I would be, I would be hurt 
or mm. um, I would hurt myself or something like that. And that's what my mum always said about the teachers in school always were concerned about. They weren't sure how to handle someone with a disability. I, You know, I was the only one in the school at the time, a little rural country town, and they didn't know what to do. But um, I think I... <laughs> I think I challenged them quite a lot uh, by just letting me get in and having a crack at everything, no matter where I came. Yeah. I think that's the thing, isn't it? A lot of people are so scared of difference, particularly when it comes to disability. They don't want to do the wrong thing. It's not about doing the wrong thing on purpose by like holding someone back, as you say. It's almost benevolent uh, in terms of trying to help you move forwards, but not quite being able to find the right way for you or the right way for them even to, to feel comfortable in doing so. Yes, definitely, definitely. Obviously, you've tried your hand at everything, and I wish I knew about the pipes, otherwise you would be playing uh, some pipes right now. Uh, but from rowing, from a rowing standpoint, you obviously found your way into rowing relatively, well, 2006-ish? Yeah. To, <laughs> another one, it was kind of where I... Um, kind of fell into it so um after school I decided I wanted to nick off and see the world and um, I put all surgeries on hold because I got sick of doing that so I uh, got my wings and flew to England and I lived over there for a couple of years and traveled around and and um unfortunately right at the end of my two-year stint I um I damaged my knee and I had to go home and see the surgeon so um uh <laughs> unfortunately he's like oh, are you in any pain with it and I said no not really and he goes like it was pretty damaged but he goes oh, all right you just do what you do and do some rehab so I did some swimming and I love swimming swimming is something that I've always loved to do and um the people I was swimming with got me into ocean competition swimming so I started doing that and and found oh I'm actually not too bad in my age group in in southwest Victoria which at the time was, um, you know, 20 to 30 and, um, you know, it was pretty, pretty uh, fast competitors in that. Um, I came sixth and that sort of sparked going, oh, someone said, why don't you try the Paralympics? And I was like, hmm, what are you talking about? Like very naive, very, very naive of, I said, I'm not in a wheelchair. I can't compete at the Paralympics, thinking that that's all that was about, like you had to be in a wheelchair to compete yeah. at the Paralympics. And and it took someone to explain to me, no, you, you don't have to to do that. And anyway, it, it flicked the switch, right? And, and I went, hmm, okay, let's have a look at this. And, you know, I love goals. I love challenges. And I, I went, rang them up and said, all right, how do I do this? How do I get into this? <laughs> and um, they said they actually had talent day coming down that way in the next, um, uh, it was a month or so, and they said, come along. So I went along to that event, you know, thinking I was going to make the team in swimming and, and uh, be a part of that. Um, and they tested me in multiple sports. So there was swimming, athletics, basketball, rowing and tennis. Um, and they said at the end of it, you know, they, they, they know what they're looking for, mm. they, uh, these talent identifiers. Um, and they said, yeah, talent in tennis and rowing. And I was like, oh, but I'm here for swimming. Like, that's, what, that's my jam. Like, that's what I like to do. And they said, look, with initial training, um, you make the London Games. You know, at the time, Beijing was 18 months away. And, you know, I like, I like goals, but my concentration level was not very long. So I was like, no, no. I want to go to Beijing. That's the goal. Uh, pick one of these sports for me and I'll do it. And they said, well, it doesn't really work like that. But you have the talent in rowing or tennis. And I was like, all right. And I said, I, I found tennis was three and a half hours away to train in Melbourne, which was too far. And uh, rowing was local. And I looked at it and I went, oh, rowing. Like that's to me, I was like, that's the dumbest sport in the world. It goes backwards. Who wants to do that? You can't even see what you're doing. Like, I just was so... <laughs> the the talent identifies, well, this is this is where your talent lies. And they tested me on the rowing machine and things like that. And they said, this is where your talent lies. And I was like, all right, yeah. I'm, I said, well, this is the goal I want to do and I'm going to get to Beijing and that's all right, I'll do it with this. And I think they thought I was a little bit special. I, I swear to God because they're like... It takes years to get into the team. It takes years to become an Olympian or a Paralympian. Years and years. People can do it forever and not get in. And I'm like, no, 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 no. 
this is what's going to happen. I'm going to go, tell me what I need to do. <laughs> I think they just told me what to do just to hurry me on because I was just badgering them so much. And um, anyway, long story short, within a very short time period, I, I think it was I started, I found a coach. I said, this is what I want to do. Um, and he again said, look, it takes, <laughs> it takes years, but we'll have a go. Um but I was pretty determined, you know, like this, you know, this is what I want to do. And then within um, six weeks, I won the state title in Victoria. And then within eight weeks of starting, I won the national title. And then within eight months of started rowing, I was number ranked number two in the world. I came second at the world champs in Munich. Wow. Um, there's a film in yeah, there. So Surely there's awesome. a film in there. <laughs> <laughs> I was, oh, wow. There's a lot of tears and a lot of like, pushing hard and and you know what I had to fight hard as well for it I had to get people to believe in me as much as I believed in myself yeah, to course. make it all happen um and you know it, it could be a film in that that'd be a really cool film um but yeah like you set though I set those goals and that's the challenge I wanted to do and then um you know and then after getting reselected and stuff like that the next goal was again uh, Beijing Games and you know, that's where I wanted that gold medal, but yeah, yeah. missed it. Incredible. Well, thank God you got there because obviously you, you didn't have the gold medal, but you came away number two of the world for, for that uh, classification, which is just crazy. It was. And, and the people who were doing the, the talent ID, they were standing there in the crowd um, and they were just like, yep, clapping, going well. Fair play. Yep, good work. <laughs> And he really was, he really was good. I mean, what an incredible challenge to set for yourself that in a heartbeat when, like you say, some people train their entire lives and never get that far. Uh, even just to get on the plane, they don't get that far. And there you are rowing in the final and, and doing well and by a fraction of a second missing out on being the best in the world. Incredible challenge to have set, but it doesn't just happen overnight, right? I mean, talk me through what your coach did with you in those 18 months to get you that far. Uh, well, in, in that time period, I, I started with a local coach um, and because my trajectory was so fast, he he then was like, oh, you're too far ahead for me already um, for his, his um, knowledge and expertise. And he was fantastic. He got me on the road exactly where I needed to be. I uh, wouldn't have done it without him. And then I had to then go to an appointed Rowing Australia coach and that was in Sydney. So I had to leave my family, my job, everything, and move. And I moved to Sydney to make that happen. Um, and and then it was, you know, pretty hard work from there, um, balancing work and training and just everyday life to make it all happen. Um, and I then had that coach right through to Beijing. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. And um, fair play to the coach that said, you're too big for me. I think that's a big that's a big, bold step for a coach that sees a lot of talent in someone who's just joined, right, uh, to put that away. Yeah, and he was, he was very good and he was very accomplished in his own right um, and, and the rowing knowledge that he had. Um, his, his sister was quite high up. She was a lightweight rower in her day. Um, his son was also trialling for the Olympic team at the time. So he was very knowledgeable. No, well, I was very fortunate to land with him straight up. Yeah, no, absolutely. And so obviously someone like that is putting people on the water regularly. Uh, and it's, it's lovely to hear that they're able to talent spot in, in such a, a direct fashion, you know, really picking out individuals and, and, and promoting those individuals, regardless, like you say, of, of, well, not regardless of ability. He's very much focused on ability. That's the whole point. We're looking at your ability, regardless of your injury or trajectory and, and what had come before. 100%, 100%. Um, and that's what they do look at. They look at uh, the, the TID people didn't look at your disability. They looked at what how your disability worked for you mm. to, to be the best in that particular sport. Yeah, no, absolutely. So rowing as a whole, you're facing challenges to get you there, but obviously you've been a part of the Olympic movement now for, for four Olympiads and and maybe more. Are you still looking to, to carry on? <laughs> well, the elusive gold still is there and it's driving me nuts trying to get to it. Uh, and, you know, like and I've had challenges along the way, like Beijing was fantastic, like it was almost there and uh, not quite. So that didn't drive that, that fire and that passion to keep going. 
And then the next one was London Games. And unfortunately, you know, my partner and I, Gavin, uh, we were number one ranked going into the games, but Gav tore both his bicep tendons on uh, one half of the bone and one quarter of the bone uh, six weeks before London Games. Oh, wow. So we went in, we would nearly were going to pull for the, from the games. We weren't even going to go, but we patched him up as much as we can. And, um, you know, we we did really, really well. We were quite quite surprised he was limping through, um, you know, didn't know if they were going to snap off at any time. Oh, my God, yeah. Um, and that was dedication from him. And, and it was tough racing, tough racing in, in London. It was fantastic. I mean, between second position and sixth position was one second. So no one knew where they were came. Um, and we ended up getting fifth in that, but it was like point zero something, something of a second off um, silver or bronze. Like it was so minute. And then Rio come about um, again coming off the back of winning three world champion titles. We were on, on mark. Again, um, injuries played, equipment. We had equipment issues. Um, everything that went wrong went wrong. And when I say those stars need to align, everything needs to align exactly right in a, when you're racing at a games. Um, and then, um, yeah, the recent ones, I came in with a brand new partner, brand new. He's unfortunately only been rowing for about uh, a year and through that year was COVID. So not a hell of a lot of training um, in in the environment that we would like. Uh, he lived in Adelaide. I live in Canberra. So borders were closed. We couldn't even train together. So we had two weeks together before Tokyo. So that was pretty tough. That was tough on many, many, many levels. But to get the result we did, um, I was super happy with that. Um, I would have liked better, of course, but um, for the for the challenge that we had ahead of us, um, you know, I had to step up and I had to do a lot more than just be an athlete in that boat um, to make it to make us come where we did come. So slowly creeping back, but you know, the next one's Paris. It is only two and a half years away. Um, would love to be able to have another crack at the gold there. Uh, again, we'll have to wait and see. That it poses all its own challenges as well with um, COVID still going on and um, working life, family life, things like that. So we'll wait and see. See how these stars align, really. Wait to see if the fifth is on the horizon. So, I mean, that raises an interesting question for me. So your first games, you come silver. Your second games, you miss out. All right, it's a fraction. Oh, it's literally, again, a fraction of a second between the entire field. But fourth is still out of the medals, right? So how do you mentally deal with that? How do you, how do you come away and be okay with the idea that you didn't medal after having medaled previously, going in as a tip favorite and not coming out with the silverware or with the, the metal? Yeah, it's, look, it's tough. It is tough. Um, it really plagues you. You know, um, and this is the, uh, the this is what people don't see and people don't don't touch on. They see us thinking it's all lights and glamour and stuff like that, but it's it's definitely not. You come away um, questioning yourself. You come away questioning your ability, what you could have done better, and and you constantly have this whole table going around and around and around in your head, going, "What if I did this better? What if I did that better? What if this? What if that?" And and a lot of it is you can't control. You can't control the weather. You can't control what happens to your equipment on the day. You know, you try to have it in the best um, condition as possible, but you don't have con control over your competitors, um, things like that. But there is that downward spiral. There is is that, and if you're not careful. Um, you can fall pretty deep. And I learned that very quickly after the Beijing Games. Even though I won a silver medal, I, you know, the, there's a highlight after, right? I was wanted. I was, people wanted you for interviews. People wanted you for all different things. Um, but unfortunately, like, after those couple of months, I was unemployed. I was eating two-minute noodles. I could barely afford my rent. Yet I'd won a medal for my country. Um, so I learned very quickly to have things in place post a games to so that I didn't fall into that hole again. And that was 
working with employment, that was working with studying um, and actually having another goal outside that. So post games have myself a goal that I can then switch on and channel into that so it didn't happen. Um, and, and it does still happen to a degree. Um, and I think it just depends if, I, if you don't have those things in place, it can make it um, very difficult if you're not careful. You hear of the post games blues, it is definitely a real thing. And um, some people struggle with it more. Um, and, and I'm a big advocate on athlete well-being and it's mental health and well-being during and post the games. Um, you know, you, we have everything organised for us leading into a game, everything, like what time we train, what we're eating, what appointments you have throughout the day. So you have your life's planned out every single day. And then as soon as you finish your race at a games, there's nothing, nothing. And it's, it's good for a few days and things like that. And then you're like, oh, what do I do now? Yeah, exactly. And it, it, it's a very bad cycle to get into if um, and a spir you can spiral out really quickly if you're not careful. So I've always made sure and try to advocate for athletes to make sure you have something in place, make sure you have another goal, another challenge, studies, um, holiday, anything like that to, to focus on poster games to help you find what the next challenge is. Mm, no, I love that concept of challenges um, supported by goals. Uh, it's not just the goals that you need to get to the challenge itself. It's those goals that, that are perennial. I mean, they're, they're just all, they should always be there. I know when I was um, recovering from my own paralysis, a lot of that was done through goal setting. And it was that bold, ambitious goal, that, that Olympic level, gold medal level goal. But it was the tiny little wins every day, the little goals, maybe more than one a day even, that would get you there. Correct. Um, and that was the way that I, I used it to, to motivate myself and build momentum. Maybe that's what we're talking about. Maybe it's maintaining momentum through the games and beyond the games using things like goals. 100%. Um, you know, I, I'm very much the same as you, Steve. I have that main goal and the main goal is, okay, X, Y, and Z. What's my goals to get to that goal and tick them off as I go? And sometimes they change a little bit as you go, um, but you always have that head goal. So if you didn't have those little ones ahead of you, oh, you can fall off that wagon real fast. Mm -hmm. Um and I, I, you know, they keep you on track. They keep you um, in tune with yourself, with what you want to do and be where you want to be in your life. And I think they're they're pivotal for everybody, not just for an athlete, but pivotal for everybody um, to have that in their lives and, and keep striving for what it is they want, no matter how big or small it is. Yeah, no, absolutely. And then looking at um, taking a slightly different line. Now, looking at the challenges, well, I mean, we've been looking at challenges of, of the individual, but let's look at challenges of the sport as a whole. I mean, rowing as a sport is, it carries a lot of baggage, right? It's got the elitism element. It's got the cash element. It's got the closed network element that everybody that doesn't row, that looks into rowing or sees rowing from the outside would would understand and, and understandably that they would understand, understandable that they would think those things. Um what do you think is the truth about rowing from the inside? What what challenges does it face and what's it doing well? What does it need to do more of? Oh, 100%. Um, there's been a big change and a shift since I started. But when I started, you know, I never went to a private school. I don't come from money. And that's, like you said, that's pivotal of what rowing is. And that rowing's been going for 100 years or more. And it's very much that toffee sport. It's very much my child is in, in rowing and and. That it's a bit of like a hierarchy in um, society status with with rowing. Um, that has since slowly started changing as they've realised that, you know, they want athletes. Athletes come from all different backgrounds and not necessarily from private schools or from money. Um, but it has been very interesting, and especially with Parasite, because um, we have only been in since oh, we started early 2004 or five, I think it originally sort of started, um, but it was like not taken seriously. And I think over the years we are slowly still not taken fully seriously, but we are breaking those barriers down. Uh, we are showing like there was a period there that the parasite um, in Rowing Australia where we 
were dominant. We were the ones bringing, you know, monies is medals. Uh, medals is money, sorry. And um, we were making, getting the medals and we were bringing the money into the funding, into the program over the Olympic guys. Um, so we kept the, the program alive. So I think there was a lot more respect there coming um, slowly through the system. And um, I think being accepted by a lot of the other athletes and the Olympic athletes more as time goes on and, and the respect that we get from them, that has opened up doors as well um, for, for people to actually see us more than just people with a disability. We, are, we have the same goals. We have the same drive. We do the same training. It's just at a different, sometimes we have to do a different type because our bodies can't cope with the, you know, sitting on a bike for hours or things like that. So um, it's slowly breaking down. And then and, and this is, again, not just in rowing, but also across the whole Paralympic movement um, to be seen in the world, to be equal. I mean, when we started, like even in Australia, we weren't even televised on regular TV. It was on on channels that people don't usually watch um even before that it wasn't even wasn't even televised um to now where we're we're on mainstream tv we are now on posters we are now you know seen as elite elite athletes next to the olympians so we are slowly getting there there are still a lot of inconsistencies in terms of funding in terms of opportunities and things like that but they are areas that we are slowly breaking down and unfortunately that won't we can't do it all on our own. We rely on society and, and um, you know, everybody else sitting down, wanting to watch us, wanting to see what we do um, and, and supporting it that way. And that's where I think barriers will eventually be broken down. Yeah, and you use the word equality there, obviously, as uh, it's a big thing in the world of disability, although that said, it's kind of been usurped by the word equity uh, over recent times. And, and I can totally understand why, right? It's, it's not about having the same, it's about having what you need, um, but it's about um, the right opportunity so that everybody gets the same opportunity to, to flourish and, and, uh, and really excel at what they do. And I, I, I make you right as well. I get the feeling, for me at least, the 2012 Olympics was a big changing point. I'm, I was living in London and 2012 for me was the first time where I saw disabled people. They were like super, they were superhuman adverts in inverted commas. You know, they, they were seen as people, but better. Yeah. And it was really interesting because that had obviously been not the case before that at all, right? We, the Paralympics was an entirely different game. So it was held at a different time. But people that flew over for the Olympics weren't still in town when the, Olymp the Paras were running um, or rowing or whatever they were doing. So, yeah, it's, it's been a, a change in a short space of time. But it feels like there's a, feels like there's a groundswell, uh, certainly the, in the, um, uh, uh, the inclusion uh, space, the DEI space. 100%. Um, that is definitely... It's like Groundhog Day all the time um, that we're trying to keep, like, trying to push us up a bit in that space of like, yeah, like we want to be a part of all these things. Like, why aren't we? To me, simple little things like, like, in Australia we have different sponsors for the Olympics and the Paralympics. Why uh, we don't? You know, there's a difference between medal money, um, where we never got any, and this was the first. Tokyo was the first time it sort of came to light um, across the nation that we actually don't get medal money. We don't. We, do, we get nothing for our medals. It's you know it's for our our heart and our glory and and what we chose to do, um, which is wonderful. But you know, like I said, we are expected to do exactly the same as the Olympic guys. Yet we weren't supported or funded that way. Um, but that came to light. So we're slowly breaking down that barrier there. Um, and just even the amount of events we have at the games, we're still fighting to have more events put in. You know, we have basically three events, whereas the Olympic guys have multiple events like eights and quads and pairs and fours and singles. And, you know, we only have three classes and there's only three boats. So the opportunity to be able to compete at games is very, very small for someone. Um, so in Australia, in my class, there's only one spot. So it's, it's a lot of work for someone to try and, um, you know, you have to be pretty exceptional to keep knocking mm. off that person in that position. But if there was more boats and, and we were included more across um, events, you would open that space up 
for more people, for more countries to compete. I mean, finding someone with the same caliber um, disability as I do is very difficult. But if there were singles, you could have all the underdeveloped countries who have people with this kind of disability that can't find a partner be able to compete. So still fighting for more inclusion um, in events and things like that. Um, and, you know, I think it's going to take time, unfortunately. <laughs> I would like it all to be changed right now and I've been fighting for, for areas in that for so long just to give people more opportunities. And, that's, and this is where indoor rowing has really exploded and absolutely love that, um, that doorway that that has finally opened up. Uh, I think in the last probably, I reckon only two years, 12 months. Yeah, it's COVID years, times, really. Um, you, we are seeing so many more people coming out and having a go because it is like a single event. People can test themselves, be a part of a, a squad, a community, uh, it, it's so vibrant and it's exciting to see where this challenge can go. And, and I've, you know, it's, it's a very, it's an area that still is growing and has a lot of growth to do, but um, it's very, very exciting. Oh, I completely agree. I think, like you say, COVID times for me, uh, there's been a lot of negative press around COVID and it's a horrible thing and, and people die and it's, it's, and families are torn apart by it. It's, it's all, it's awful. But the flip side to anything like that that's awful is that, well, what's the opportunity? What came from it? And I think technology has been a real growth sp element to the sport. It's probably accelerated five, 10 years to what it might have done otherwise. And you, seeing groups out there like Zoom Ergos really turned my eyes to the sport when I was like, you mean I can row with Matthew Pinson in his garage while I'm in my garage and we can basically be on the same team? I mean, it's just a, it's a total no-brainer, isn't it? I mean, who doesn't want to get involved and row alongside Olympians and Paralympians and all sorts of fantastic people and, and just have a go? It's not about time trials and being the best in the world. Sometimes it's about having half an hour to make yourself a little fitter than you were and have fun while you do it. Um, and that's why I think the indoor rowing thing is going to be a, an interesting an interesting push. Uh, but certainly for me, I think that the whole reason Enduro Challenge came around was because it could be everyone everywhere, no matter who they are, no matter how able or disabled or what colour or what age or what sex or what gender or whatever it was, they could all just come and play together. And that was, that's the community aspect of it, I think, is what really turns me on. Yeah, I 100% agree. Um, and that's, you know, I, I love um, getting on there. And, and like you said, people were like, oh, can I, can I race against you? And I was like, sure, like... You know, I love a challenge. If you want to challenge me, come on, like, let's go. Like, it's so – I found it very exciting and I was the same. I, I – uh, we were locked down. I was in my garage training and, you know, again, it's that whole goal focus and how do you stay on path, you know. It's pretty mundane and groundhog day sitting in there day after day um, trying to stay focused when the games were delayed and things like that. Um, you know, I had to find another challenge. and. When I saw this all come about, I was like, this is fantastic. Like everybody and anybody can have a go. And anyone who thought that they, you know, would never have thought of doing this kind of thing are in there having a crack. And uh, it's just like, and the technology, we're very fortunate to um, to have technology come the way it has. And, and as you said, um, you know, COVID is, is horrendous. Um, you know, I work as a nurse. I'm in emergency uh, nurse and I, I deal with COVID and I see COVID at its finest, uh, which is not very nice and I would never wish that upon anybody. Um, however, I'm also that person that likes to look on the flip side. Okay, what's good that's come out of this? What can we see come, good come out of this? And it, it has opened eyes up to people in terms of what's important, you know, family's important. Um, spending time, you know, we work way too much. You know, do we need to be working as much as we do? And technology, we have the ability to, as you and I right now, be able to talk across the world and be able to share experiences and and um, challenges and goals and and be able to do that. Like I think it's absolutely fantastic. And I, I did the world indoor and I got to compete against other people across the road, world and just see see us all competing at the one time and make it all happen like it was phenomenal like it was absolutely brilliant and I can't say enough good things about it for people to get in have a crack like it's so good yeah. absolutely
No, completely. I mean, obviously, you're in Canberra. I'm on GMT, so you're a good 11 hours ahead of me, which means that come February the 5th at 12 o'clock UK time, it's going to be a very late day for you if you wanted to get involved with the Jura Challenge. I won't put you on the spot, but I'm going to assume that you will row. Um, but yeah, it's going to be staying up for a late row this time, literally for the Rowing Australia community. Uh, when I was talking to the guys before, I was so honoured to have people in um, in Australia send me videos of their macro venues, so people rowing together in a group, because it was a 2 a.m. start for them last time. Uh, so they rowed from 2 to 6 in the morning. That is a long, long row at a very early time in the day. Um, but, yeah, we brought it forward. So now it's going to be staying up late for a long row rather than getting up very early for a long row. So, yeah, 11 till 3 for you. Oh, that's all right. That's like, you know, half a night shift or something. Maybe I could get a few nurses together, have an erg in the back room, and we just take turns in between sh- shifts or um – that is that is absolutely a date, and I'm going to uh, get on. The, we'll get on to the uh, the live stream, and we'll come over to you and come say hi at three in the morning. Could be something we could look at, sure. But uh, you also mentioned something there, which is really close to my heart as well. And I think you're right. I think technology has allowed. I mean, who hasn't got a phone in their pocket with a video on it these days? Particularly in the West, even more and more people in emerging markets are being able to get access to similar technology now, uh, and it's wonderful to see not just the big obvious countries, the, the rich westernized countries, um, being able to compete in the sport. And um, I've, I've just come off the phone in the recent weeks to Zambia, to Tunisia, you know, NC, uh, NGBs that are going to be involved in Enduro Challenge. They're going to row with us on the day, which is just lovely to, to hear and see. Um, but isn't it wonderful that we can train athletes to be athletes, whether they're para or non para, uh, and we can all just play together. I think that's, that's going to be a fascinating experience. Oh, it's going to be fantastic. No, it will. It really will. And those people are being helped as well. But, I mean, let's not forget why we're doing this. Uh, We're fundraising for the Power Rowing Foundation this year. So the Power Rowing Foundation, for those that don't know, uh, help athletes with impairments around the world, whoever they are, wherever they are, to find their best athlete through rowing, to be the best athlete they can be through rowing. And I know you've had some experience with the PRF yourself, haven't you? A little bit, yes. Um, uh, Look, I first heard about this and saw this when I was actually in Italy competing, um, believe it or not. In Gavarate. Yes, in Gavarate. And I saw, you know, these wonderful athletes coming through I'd never seen before because, you know, rowing's quite a small community, so you usually see the same, same. Um, and I saw these new faces and I was like, oh, who are these guys? And and then I, I got in touch with um, a couple of the new coaches that were there and said, well, you know, what, what are you guys doing? And it was part of this, um, you know, power rowing program and, and about touching in um, with athletes in in hard to reach places and who aren't sure how to get started and things like that and that, that really resonated with me and there was people from um, Sweden and Argentina and um, Mexico Nigeria would have been there. Nigeria that's it yes oh and so excited so um, and it was interesting while I was there I saw them setting up boats and things like that and and um, you know, I, I saw some things. I was like, "Oh, oh, I think they need some help with that." So I was, I was so keen to jump in and give them a hand and go, "Hey, you know, when with someone with this impairment, try this and try this." Because you know, I've been around since the start of it, pretty much, and I've seen equipment change and I've seen what works for different disabilities or what doesn't, and things like that um, to get the best out of that athlete. So it was great. I, I tried to jump in and be, have, be a part of it a little bit while I was there competing, but. Loved it. I love seeing those athletes coming through, and then seeing them there at the games like was so beautiful. And so, like, just shows that this program works, and love being a part of it in any way that I can. And I touch base with these athletes still, and hope to mentor them a little bit um, to hopefully get you know those goals and goals and goals that they want. Yeah, oh, it's a fantastic. Program. Ultimately, we're, we're training the next generation. So the more people that come through, the better. You know, the more bodies in boats, the better. But if those bodies can be well coached and well trained, then it's better competition. It just makes it more interesting to watch, brings new sponsors, continues the future of the, of the sport as well, right? So it's good for everyone. Oh, everything you just said is, is spot on, is spot on. And that's, and also reach it, getting into hard to reach areas, mm. um, and having them have the opportunity to compete and stuff. Oh, love it. Like seeing them represent their country, um, it gives you little warm fuzzies, you know, to, have, oh, to know it that does. it, it might have helped in some way and what some small way. Um, I'd love to be able to 
be a part of that journey, po- you know, even now and then post my personal journeys to help develop this sport and make it grow and be the biggest and best that it can be. Well, you're a fabulous ambassador for it, Kat. So uh, thanks for everything you've done. We could talk all night, but unfortunately we don't have the time. So I'm going to have to say goodbye, um, but thank you for being a guest on the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Stephen. It's been an absolute pleasure. My pleasure. And uh, 5th of February, 2022, 12 o'clock GMT, which obviously, as we know is now, is going to be 11 o'clock for you. Um, hopefully we'll see everyone everywhere pulling together. Thanks very much.